Hey adapters, I'm Doug Parsons. I'm a partner at Simpatico Studios where we live stream conversations about complex business and social challenges with professionals like yourself who are working on the same issues. Our shows are live stream in front of a global audience of your professional peers on simpatico.tv. I'm building a new type of online community for professionals like yourself on the Climate Adaptation Channel. If you're a regular listener of my America Adapts podcast, I think you'll find that we're taking our conversations about important problems, policies, and solutions to the next level here. And if you're interested in being a guest, we'd love to hear from you. And now join us for this latest episode. Hey Adapters, today our guest is Diego Saez Gil. Diego is the CEO and co-founder of Pachama. He has over 10 years of experience leading teams who design and build innovative products. MIT has identified Diego as one of their 35 innovators under 35. Accurate and transparent monitoring has been a challenge for the carbon credit markets. Diego will share how Pachama brings credibility to forest carbon markets by utilizing LiDAR and AI to provide real-time verification of forest projects. Hey Diego, welcome to the show. Hey Doug, good to be here. Thank you so much. All right, so let's just check in first. You are in the Santa Cruz area, but what's going on with COVID-19? How's it influencing how you guys are doing your work? Well, the first uh, thing is that we moved uh, to be a fully remote company, which is something that we, we wanted from the beginning and actually is opening up the possibility for us to hire people outside of California, which is good. And you know, COVID is definitely also having an impact on, on many companies that were thinking on acting on climate change. Um, and that is slowing down a little bit the carbon markets, but we know that this is going to recover and that companies are increasingly um, focused on, on having climate action. So um, yeah, adapting to, to COVID, but still um, very, very excited about the progress of our company. Okay, so let's talk about what is Pachama? Pachama is a platform that helps companies that are looking to take action on climate change and offset their current emissions, connect with high quality projects that are doing reforestation or forest conservation and that have received carbon credit certificates. We not only connect the parties through an online platform, but we also validate every single project using satellite images and artificial intelligence to increase the trust, the accountability, and the transparency of this market. And the ultimate mission of the company is to help drive billions of dollars to restoring the forest, which is one of the most important solutions to climate change. Okay, so and you've touched upon it a little bit, but how is your approach really unique? Yeah, so historically, the problem with forest as a solution to climate change was that it is not easy to validate how much carbon is the forest capturing. We all know that trees convert CO2 into biomass as they grow, but to measure how much they do that, historically we needed to send people to the field to count trees and measure every single tree. But today we have a lot of high definition satellite images that can observe the tree's growth from space. And we have artificial intelligence that can analyze that data at scale and make predictions that are very accurate. So we're building tools to harness those technologies to validate how much is that the, the, the forest is, is uh, capturing carbon. And with that, give trust to the companies that want to utilize forest as a way to compensate their carbon emissions. So what's novel and unique about us is the use of these technologies, bringing these technologies to this market. Okay, you know why I've got an expert here. I'm always curious, you know, there are these experiments where they increase carbon dioxide in maybe a small forest because they want to know what the impact will be on the growth of those forests. And so if you're looking at these big, broad expanses of forest through satellite data, are you seeing anything like that? Or do you even factor in this notion? And then I guess there's even some evidence that if increased carbon might actually stunt their ability. Do you have to, I mean, there's all these complications that go into like measuring carbon. Is that coming into the conversation at all? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, climate change is changing the conditions uh, that affect the growth of a forest. In some cases, it's going to affect it negatively and forests are actually becoming smaller 
um, as, as, as a result of, of higher temperatures. But in other cases, actually, uh, climate change is good news for the forest. You know, there's more CO2 to be converted into, into biomass, and there is better, you know, climatic conditions for the growth of a forest. Uh, we are observing that we're at the beginning of harnessing this data to make more global analytics about the state of the forest in the planet today. Well, does that actually even get down to the level of you have these carbon markets, you have these offsets, and you're saying, all right, parts per million has gone up to 420. That's that much additional carbon sequestered in these type of four. Is, is it even getting down to that level of detail? Because, you know, when you have to verify these things, is, is that coming up? Yeah, I mean, what's important when verifying these projects is you need to be able to compare what is that this project is helping uh, avoid of emissions or capture carbon as compared to a business as usual scenario, right? So for example, take the Amazon rainforest where there is a lot of deforestation expanding. This deforestation sometimes means clear cutting the forest or burning the forest. So we need to be able to calculate, okay, what, what have been the emissions of this forest being burned out versus conserving this forest? And this is the delta of the, of the carbon that, that this project can receive as a, as a credit. And yeah, we're, we're trying to go down to, to a very precise estimations of that down to the, the, the plot level. And, and plot, I mean, you know, uh, one acre of land in which we can calculate what is the current storage there and what is the difference between the project versus the, the business as usual scenario. Yeah, well, could you actually share in the, there's a history on the founding of your company and partly related to your trip to the Amazon. Could you share a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I'm originally from Argentina. I came to the U.S. Uh, about uh, 11 years ago uh, and became a technology entrepreneur, built two technology companies, nothing to do with environmentalism. Um, but after my last company exited, I became very concerned about climate change. And uh, I happened to do a trip to the Amazon with my two brothers, to the Amazon rainforest in Peru, which was amazing, super inspiring to see this old growth, powerful forest. And also was heartbreaking to see deforestation happening there in the border of civilization and the Amazon rainforest. And to me, you know, it was really crazy that the forest is one of the most important solutions that we have to climate change. And instead of being reforesting at scale, which is what we should be doing right now, what we continue to do as a humanity is destroying the forest that we have standing. So then I came back to California and I decided to put my experience building technology companies, raising venture capital, assembling engineering teams at the service of this mission. How can we save the forest to solve climate change? And uh, an amazing team came together to bring these technologies that Silicon Valley built for other industries, put them at the service of this market. Okay, I wanna come back to the, the, the Amazon as part of this discussion, but uh, could you tell us the status of forced carbon markets? It's just, you obviously are providing a, a tool to have more reliability in those, but what, what is their current status right now? Yeah, so carbon markets, um, started in the late 90s in the Kyoto Agreement, which was the predecessor to the Paris Agreement. It had an initial uh, life that then kind of like faded down. And, but now after the Paris Agreement, carbon markets have started growing again. According to the World Bank, over $80 billion went to carbon market initiatives last year, including uh, voluntary markets and compliance markets. Now, only a very small percentage of that market is going to forest. About 2% is estimated of that, that money is going to forest. Um, now, in the, in the meantime, we do have about a billion hectares in the planet that can be restored as forest and that could participate in this market. And the, the gap that we identified and many, many experts identified is how can we validate and certify those land areas for carbon credits in a way that is high integrity, highly trusted, so that we can then channel significant capital to, to finance this reforestation and forest conservation. So we're talking about a market that can grow a lot, provided that uh, this enhanced trust can be built. And that's what we're trying to do with these technologies.
I actually, I think just read a headline that, the, and you mentioned it's such a small fraction of force being of those carbon markets offsets, but as the Amazon's burning up, people have invested monies with this implication that, okay, this is an intact system and we're offsetting because we're protecting the Amazon. What, what's going on with that is that with there's so many fires, if a particular force burns up, does someone go and tell that company that did the offset, like, okay, well, it's pointless now. Well, I, I guess I don't get that. Could you explain? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, all these projects have a risk of reversal and fires are, you know, one of the risks. Uh, illegal deforestation is another risk, and, 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 and these projects are designed to prevent uh, deforestation and prevent fires, and the funding that is going to these projects is uh, designed to, to do efforts to prevent those risks, but the reality is that these risks are real and they can happen. So the system of current credits is designed in a way that there is a, a buffer pool of credits. Each project that gets certified contributes to this buffer pool that is almost like an insurance pool. So if a reversal happens on a particular project, then uh, credits get taken from that pool to make sure that the total compensation is actually real. Um, and, and unfortunately, fires are going to continue to happen, it are going to happen more, if anything, with, with climate change and higher temperatures. But these efforts are designed to, to, to try to prevent that. You know, so, uh, the fact that these, you know, reversals can happen shouldn't be a reason not to invest in this type of projects. And yeah, I mean, you ask about the Amazon. The Amazon, the risk today is that uh, there is a study that says that if we deforest more than 25% of the Amazon rainforest, then there is sort of like a tipping point in which a positive feedback loop starts, and the entire Amazon can start desertifying. And if the Amazon desertifies, that has a huge implication for the global ecosystems because the Amazon produces clouds that then travel to other regions of the world um, in a way humidifying other ecosystems. So if we lose the Amazon, we, we start losing a lot of other areas where we produce food and, and it can have terrible impacts on humanity and on the planet at large. Today, we have deforested about 17% of the Amazon already and we continue expanding at, at, at high speed, unfortunately. In Brazil this year, we had more deforestation than, than in the last 10 years, right? Yeah. So um, these frameworks are super, super important as a way to stop or, or reverse the trend of deforestation in these areas. You think of just one acre of rainforest being destroyed is just tragic what, what goes on in those rainforests. All right, I have some yeah. questions from the, the chat room here from Ken. Can you drill down on how you quantify the economic value of 1 billion hectares of forest and does it significantly vary by region or forest type? Yeah, good question. So um, each forest has a different uh, concentration of carbon uh, depending on, on, on the weather, depending on the type of species that you have. Of course, tropical forests are the most carbon dense. You know, in a, in a, in a tropical forest, you can have up to 200 tons of uh, carbon in one hectare. Um, boreal forests also capture a lot, of, a lot of carbon. So what we do is we, we do this estimation by observing the size of the trees. Um, and then there's, there are formulas to determine how that size of a tree converts into an amount of carbon. And, and then there is a price per carbon in the market today. The price per carbon ranges between four and fifteen dollars per ton and so to make an estimation of what is the value of a, of a forest by its carbon capture you need to do this estimation of how much carbon is there what is the additional carbon that can be captured and what is the price uh, per ton but uh, we did a we did a, a quick estimation of if we were to reforest this billion hectares then that has a potential value of about 800 billion dollars and hundred billion dollars is is sounds like a lot of money. It's actually not if you compare it to the GDP of the entire right. planet. Right? Right. It's, it's a very tiny percentage of the GDP of the planet. So if we were a smart civilization, we would be investing this this tiny percentage of our GDP to restore the ecosystem that can you know prevent a catastrophe in the future, right? Okay, so how is your company specifically bring greater accuracy and transparency into the whole market? Yeah, so you know, historically, again, we did this 
on-site visits to study how much carbon is there in a the forest. And then a new verification was done every a couple of years because it's so expensive and complicated to send people to all this forest and to take samples. What we do instead is we use satellite images and there are several satellite companies that are collecting data on a daily basis actually. And we take this satellite data, we process the data through our algorithms that then automatically detect changes on the forest and can estimate how much carbon is there. And with that, we produce reports that allows us to know in real time and objectively how much carbon is there and, and whether the projects are delivering on their commitments or not. Um, the intention is with these tools to help originate new projects, make it easier, democratize access to, to this market, to anybody who owns a forest. Um, today, because it's so expensive and slow, um, generally the projects are very large projects owned by uh, large organizations or governments. But we want this to be accessible for a family owned forest, for a farmer who has a small forest that can be making money by planting trees. Um, we hope that these tools can help, uh, can help these, these players access the market. All right, so I, I'm getting that your company, you're, you're providing, I guess, a more sophisticated carbon market product. And, like, and, and I'm thinking of your clients, you know, you have clients who are interested in offsetting and carbon markets, but maybe some just don't have high expectations of what they're purchasing. I mean, is that the kind of niche that you're going for is like, all right, this is the kind of a premium approach to what this whole thing is? You could say so. And definitely we are resonating a lot with sophisticated uh carbon buyers who care a lot about the impact of their investments. We're working with companies such as Microsoft, Shopify, SoftBank, uh, that have dedicated teams who understand deeply this market and they, they chose to work with us because they know the value of what we're bringing. But we think that the entire market should move to, to, to this level of uh, accuracy, to this level of um, uh, accountability. You know, if we're going to be making these investments, if companies are going to be claiming that they are carbon neutral, then they have to take their claims very seriously. And so we hope that, that this you know, uh, increased transparency and higher standards that we're bringing to the market trickle down and the entire market uh, you know, becomes uh, like that. Okay, we have another question from the chat room and I'm going to read this and it's from Kayla. I wonder about the restoration of this land in terms of Bex and Bex is just Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And I think Kayla thinks too highly of Maya. I, I needed to ask her what the acronym was for. I'm, my brain's getting soft. So Lightbex has been talked about to help with addressing climate change and requires a lot of land. So if we reforest, can we not use Bex? Yes, Bex is a very controversial solution to climate change because it entails planting trees to then cut them down and then burn them for, 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 for fuel, right? And you know we are of the position, or I am personally of the position that you know we should be producing energy with renewable energy sources that today we know that are enough to satisfy uh, humanity's uh, needs, including solar, wind, and hydro, uh, and nuclear. We could be generating all the energy that the planet needs, and I think that forests should be restored for carbon capture and for timber material. And, um, you know, I, I think we, we should be exploring and analyzing all the options as solutions to climate change, but we are the position of, you know, natural carbon, uh, you know, tied to the ecosystem value of it as well. So there seems to be a lot of independent carbon market work going on. There are a lot of companies out there in this space how would like a broader uh, regulatory framework or policy framework influence what you're doing? Like it, let's, and I'm throwing out just a big giant carbon tax or a cap and trade, creating some sort of structure. It, would that be a good thing or a bad thing for what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, we, we do think that we do need more policy uh, action. Uh, we do need more regulated markets. We do need more requirements for com companies, especially the big polluters, to take responsibility for their CO2 emissions. We think that you know, carbon taxes and carbon uh, mar markets in general uh, are a, an incentive as well for companies to transition out to fossil fuels. There are really good results of carbon uh, regulations in Europe, in Australia, in um, Korea, in, in, in California. We have a really good uh, program. 
and we hope and and we see this this trend happening um, of of more regulations. And of course, these regulations need to be designed in a way that the funding that is collected from these companies goes actually to solutions to climate change and not to other things, right? Um, but but yeah, I mean, all these regulations uh, benefit us, and we do hope that. Um, that there can be a new version of the Paris Agreement that has even more buy-in from countries that um, that that really you know makes uh, the polluters you know pay for 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 their for their pollution. And if we don't do that, you know the planet is going to be into a big trouble. And we do think that that uh, private initiative and, and and free markets, voluntary markets, are actually a really good part of the piece. But also we do need regulation to 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 get there on time. Uh, just digging back into the actual tools that you're using, how exactly do you use AI in what you're doing? Yeah, so we use a, a AI technique called deep learning, convolutional neural networks in particular, that basically learns by comparing sources of data. So in one, in one side, we input satellite images. We also input LiDAR data, which is this three-dimensional cloud of points that can be collected by an airplane of a, of a forest. And then we match that also with field plot measurements done by forest services or other entities from around the world. And basically this artificial intelligence techniques learns to correlate that this shape, this combination of colors correlates with this amount of carbon. Um, and, and that's how then the algorithm can start making predictions. You then show a picture to the algorithm and then the algorithm can predict how much carbon is there. Kind of like similar to the way that Facebook knows that your face is your face because it starts, you know, learning that the shape of your eyebrows, you know, is you, right? Uh, similarly, we, we, we know that the shape of, of a tree, you know, it's, it's about the age of a tree and the amount of carbon in a tree. It's been a while, but I was in the space using GIS and it's been a long time. And there was always like with LIDAR, what, when is the new batch of it coming out? And I guess I haven't kept up is since there's so many like drones and satellites. It, I mean, is it, is that kind of information just, you know, almost real time? What's the status of that kind of information? Yeah, definitely. LiDAR is a field that's been advancing a lot. Uh, NASA has sent a LiDAR device to the International Space Station and is releasing data from, from there. It's called the JEDI program. And um, we're going to be having all this, you know, uh, LiDAR from the entire planet. Oh. Um, and in addition to that, yes, today you can attach a LiDAR to a drone and you can fly a drone with a LiDAR. And uh, this, this is, a, is, a, is, a, is a field that is being advanced a lot by self-driving cars, for example, that needs the LiDAR to, 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 to navigate uh, the, the cities. And as a result of that, there is way more data than ever before. And that's really good news you know, for, for, for us and, and for the world. Um, and then it's about, okay, how do we process all the data? How do we make sure that, that we maintain this data up to date? Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time. I'm really not that old, but I remember that sometimes it'd be like, oh, well, this data is only two years old and you were happy with it or something like that. And so times have changed. All right, just a, another one last question here before we wrap this up, but where do you see Pachama in five years? Where, where are you guys going? Yeah, well, we hope that in five years, we are um, a major player in carbon markets. Um, I hope that we have helped by then uh, protect at least 10 million hectares of forest. Uh, that's kind of like an internal aspirational metric that we have. And I hope that uh, that we have attracted a lot of very talented people who want to work some climate change. At the end of the day, as a founder of a company, I care about uh, do I have the right team? And and you know we are having you know actually amazing people that wants to work with us. And and I hope that you know the planet has. Um, has taken real action for climate change five years from now because really time is of the essence on, on this on this cause. Well, that's a great story too. Is that your trip to the Amazon and seeing those shocking changes that allowed you to take your skills and your space to come back and apply it to something this way? That's that's very exciting. Thank you. All right. Well, l let's just wrap this up. Um, we're, there's a couple more questions I want to ask when we go into just chatting, but let's just close out the episode. We'll be right back and just hold on, just one sec. 